Sax Romer's The Insidious Dr. Fu Manchu Narrated by Edward E. French Being a somewhat detailed account of the amazing adventures of Nayland Smith in his trailing the sinister Chinaman. Chapter 26 The clammy touch of the mist revived me. The culmination of the scene in the poison cellars, together with the effects of the fumes which I had inhaled again, had deprived me of consciousness. Now I knew that I was afloat on the river. I was still bound. Furthermore, a cloth was wrapped tightly about my mouth, and I was secured to a ring in the deck. By moving my aching head to the left, I could look down into the oily water. By moving it to the right, I could catch a glimpse of the empurpled face of Inspector Weymouth, who, similarly bound and gagged, lay beside me. But only the feet and legs of Nayland Smith, for I could not turn my head sufficiently far to see more. We were aboard an electric launch. I heard the hated guttural voice of Fu Manchu, subdued now to its habitual calm, and my heart leaped to hear the voice that answered him. It was that of Karamani. His triumph was complete. Clearly his plans for departure were complete. His slaughter of the police in the underground passages had been a final reckless demonstration of which the Chinaman's subtle cunning would have been incapable had he not known his escape from the country to be assured. What fate was in store for us? How would he avenge himself upon the girl who had betrayed him to his enemies? What portion awaited those enemies? He seemed to have formed the singular determination to smuggle me into China. But what did it purpose in the case of Weymouth, and in the case of Nayland Smith? All but silently we were feeling our way through the mist. A stern died the clangor of dock and wharf into a remote discord. Ahead hung the foggy curtain veiling the traffic of the great waterway. But through it broke the calling of sirens, the tinkling of bells. The gentle movement of the screw ceased altogether. The launch lay heaving slightly on the swells. A distant throbbing grew louder, and something advanced upon us through the haze. A bell rang, and muffled by the fog, a voice proclaimed itself, a voice which I knew. I felt Weymouth writhing impotently beside me, heard him mumbling incoherently, and I knew that he too had recognized the voice. It was that of Inspector Ryman of the River Police, and their launch was within biscuit throw of that which we lay. Hoy! Hoy! I trembled, a feverish excitement claimed me. They were hailing us. We carried no lights. But now, and ignoring the pain which shot from my spine to my skull, I craned my neck to the left. The port light of the police launch glowed angrily through the mist. I was unable to utter any save mumbling sounds, and my companions were equally helpless. It was a desperate position. Had the police seen us, or had they hailed at random? The light drew nearer. Launch! Hoy! They had seen us. Fu Manchu's guttural voice spoke shortly, and our screw began to revolve again. We leaped ahead into the bank of darkness. Faint grew the light of the police launch, and was gone. But I heard Ryman's voice shouting, Full speed! came faintly through the darkness. Port! Port! Then the murk closed down, and with our friends far astern of us we were racing deeper into the fog banks, speeding seaward, though of this I was unable to judge at the time. On we raced, and on, sweeping over growing swells. Once a black, towering shape dropped down upon us. Far above, lights blazed, bells rang, vague cries pierced the fog. The launch pitched and rolled perilously, but weathered the wash of the liner, which so nearly had concluded this episode. It was such a journey as I had taken once before, early in our pursuit of the genius of the yellow peril. But this was infinitely more terrible, for now we were utterly in Fu Manchu's power. A voice mumbled in my ear. I turned my bound-up face, and Inspector Weymouth raised his hands in the dimness and partly slipped the bandage from his mouth. I've been working at the cords since we left those filthy cellars, he whispered. My wrists are all cut. When I've got out a knife and freed my ankles... Smith had kicked him with his bound feet. The detective slipped the bandage back to position and placed his hands behind him again. Dr. Fu Manchu, wearing a heavy overcoat but no hat, came aft. 
who is dragging Karamani by the wrists. He seated himself on the cushions near to us, pulling the girl down beside him. Now I could see her face, and the expression in her beautiful eyes made me writhe. Fu Manchu was watching us, his discolored teeth faintly visible in the dim light to which my eyes were becoming accustomed. In my hands, Doctor, he continued, I hold a needle charged with a rare culture. It is the link between the bacilli and the fungi. You have seemed to display an undue interest in the peach and pearl which render my caramani so delightful. In the supple grace of her movements and the sparkle of her eyes. You can never devote your whole mind to those studies which I have planned for you whilst such distractions exist. A touch of this keen point. The laughing Karamani becomes a shrieking hag, the maniacal Maui. <laughs> then, with an ox like rush, Weymouth was upon him. Karamani, wrought upon past endurance, with a sobbing cry, sank to the deck. I lay still. I managed to writhe into a half sitting posture, and Smith rolled aside as the detective and the Chinaman crashed down together. Weymouth had one big hand at the doctor's yellow throat. With his left, he grasped the Chinaman's right. It held the needle. Now I could look along the length of the little craft, and, so far as it was possible to make out in the fog, only one other was aboard, the half-clad brown man who navigated her and who had carried us through the cellars. The murk had grown denser and now shut us in like a box. The throb of the motor, the hissing breath of the two who fought, with so much at issue, these sounds and the wash of water alone broke the eerie stillness. By slow degrees, and with reptilian agility horrible to watch, Fu Manchu was neutralizing the advantage gained by Weymouth. His clawish fingers were fast in the big man's throat. The right hand, with its deadly needle, was forcing down the left of his opponent. He had been underneath, but now he was gaining the upper place, his powers of physical endurance must have been truly marvellous. His breath was whistling through his nostrils significantly, but Weymouth was palpably tiring. The latter suddenly changed his tactics by a supreme effort, to which he was spurred, I think, by the growing proximity of the needle. He raised Fu Manchu by the throat and arm and pitched him sideways. The Chinaman's grip did not relax and the two wrestlers dropped a writhing mass upon the port cushions. The launch heeled over, and my cry of horror was crushed back into my throat by the bandage, for, as Fu Manchu sought to extricate himself, he overbalanced, fell back, and, bearing Weymouth with him, slid into the river. The mist swallowed them up. There are moments of which no man can recall his mental impressions, moments so acutely horrible that, mercifully, our memory retains nothing of the emotions they occasioned. This was one of them. A chaos ruled in my mind. I had a vague belief that the Burman, forward, glanced back. Then the course of the launch was changed. How long intervened between the tragic end of that gargantuan struggle and the time when a black wall leaped suddenly up before us, I cannot pretend to state. With a sickening jerk we ran aground. A loud explosion ensued, and I clearly remember seeing the brown man leap out into the fog, which was the last I saw of him. Water began to wash aboard. Fully alive to our imminent peril, I fought with the cords that bound me, but I lacked poor Weymouth's strength of wrist, and I began to accept as a horrible and imminent possibility a death from drowning within six feet of the bank. Beside me, Nayland Smith was straining and twisting. I think his object was to touch Karamani in the hope of arousing her. Where he failed in this project, the inflowing water succeeded. A silent prayer of thankfulness came from my very soul when I saw her stir, when I saw her raise her hands to her head, and saw the big, horror-bright eyes gleam through the mist veil.
copyright exists on all recordings issued by Edward E. French. Any unauthorized broadcasting, public performance, copying, or re-recording of such recordings in any manner whatsoever will constitute an infringement of such copyright. Editing, alteration, or redistribution inconsistent with copyright laws is prohibited, whether by digital, electronic, or other means.